Good morning, friends. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor at Circular Congregational Church. And on behalf of our church, it is my delight to welcome you to our online morning worship on this beautiful Easter morning here in the Low Country. But we say in the spirit of our progressive and inclusive faith that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we are glad that you're here. And we like to symbolize that spirit of welcome and inclusion by taking a moment to pass a word of peace as we begin. So I invite you in these physically distant times to text a word of peace, uh, to whisper a prayer for peace for someone you're thinking of or for the world, or in your own way, just to observe a moment of peace at this time. And as we do, I believe we have a few brief announcements. Good morning and happy Easter. My name is Ben Tenniel, and I'm a member of the Mission Fund Committee here at Circular. Last Sunday's offering was dedicated to funding the efforts of this congregation through the Mission Fund to find new and innovative ways to meet the needs of our community and to help those in need in our community. Your ideas are just as important as your contributions. Grant applications for the spring cycle uh, for funds from the mission committee uh, are due April 9th, just five days from now. All of the information that you need to file an application is on the church website, and there's information on the website about other grant applications that have been, have been approved in the past. There are no bad ideas about how to help people. There are only good ideas. If you're passionate about trying to meet a need in this community and have ideas about how this congregation can help, please file a grant application. There's an old saying, in the nonprofit community, one voice, one vision can change the world. One vision coming out of this congregation through its mission fund can change this community and make it a better place for those in need. So please get your grant application in by April 9th. And please give us your ideas. They're the seeds that we plant that grow into something bigger. Have a nice holiday. I have a final announcement to share, and it's really just an invitation. I wanted to invite you to Circular's Spring Lectures in Theology and Ethics later this month. We are so excited to welcome Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen April 29th and 30th, to speak on living in a world of others. If you don't know Professor Wynn, he teaches at the University of Southern California. He has won the Pulitzer Prize for his fiction. And just this year, the New Yorker magazine said that Professor Nguyen has established himself as a conscience of American literature. We are more than delighted to welcome him and we hope you'll join us online for those lectures. You can find out about this event and everything else happening in the life of our church by checking the church newsletter or our app. So now that we've gathered ourselves and shared a few announcements, I invite you to join me in taking a few deep breaths as we listen to the choral intro. And let's remember all who have gone before us. Let's ground ourselves in the beauty of this day. And let's feel the tie that binds us as we join ourselves in worship together.
light this candle as a symbol of the mystery that is within us, among us, and at the same time beyond us. This mystery brings us together as one. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, we are one. I'm Marjorie Wentworth, and I'm reading The Call to Worship for Easter. Please join me for The Call to Worship by Reverend Jeremy Rutledge. We gather to worship this Easter morning, and all the earth sings Alleluia. The sun rising over low country marsh, silently declaring a new day. The dogwood and azalea blooms crowding our vision with a riot of color. The bluebird singing from a nesting box, her fledglings gathered close. The child humming and giggling while searching for hidden eggs. We gather to worship this Easter morning, joining the earth's alleluias with our own. Hallelujah for the sun and the flower. Hallelujah for the bird and the child. Hallelujah for the new day, the new life, the new path, not like the old. Amen. Tyler Ung, and I'm the Associate Minister here at Circular Church, and it is my delight to welcome our children to our Easter morning service. Easter, to me, means new life, and you'll hear more about new life from Jeremy in a few minutes, but as I thought about new life, I remembered a walk that I just went on a few days ago. I walked around the pond here in Park Circle. Some of you may know it. And as I walked around the pond, I noticed a family of ducks. There were two parent ducks and there were about four adorable little ducklings. They were nibbling on the grass. And when I saw those yellow fuzzy ducklings, you know what I didn't think? I didn't think huh, those are some weirdly shaped Easter eggs. No, 
they were already ducklings. And when I see birds or ducks flying through the sky, I don't think, whoa, those are some very big ducklings. No, because they're ducks. So this Easter, I invite you to play a game. And this game is very simple. All you have to do is notice something that you like. For me, it was ducklings. And then, once you've noticed it, it's time to imagine what it once was or what it might become. For me, I noticed the ducklings and I thought about them as beautiful little eggs or about graceful ducks swimming or flying. And this is a game about finding new life because there is new life all around us and there is new life that is coming. We can say a quick prayer and then we'll move on with our service. God, whose name is love, we thank you for the new life that you can bring, for the ways that things can change and grow. We pray this in your love. Amen. And amen. Never has the Easter message seemed more meaningful and laden with promise. As we witness the bright green buds on branches and azaleas blooming around us, we breathe in new life, we savor it, and pray for days that are worry-free. This past year, our ordinary troubles have too often been eclipsed by the existential fear brought on by the pandemic, and that's to be expected. But rather than turn away, let us remember that we all suffered. On Easter, we share in God's suffering. On Good Friday, but soon we share God's joy and rejoice in the resurrection. The courageous theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote extensively about Easter, even from his prison cell in the months before his execution at the hands of the Nazis. He reminds us that those with faith in the resurrection of Jesus can't flee the reality of the world, but neither can we be totally mesmerized by the world. In the midst of the old creation, it's about recognizing God's new creation, he wrote. Jesus Christ, the resurrected, means that God, out of love and omnipotence, brings an end to death and bestows new life. One cannot help but consider that Bonhoeffer was praying for a world without Hitler, a world without war and violence. We yearn for a world without COVID-19. We despair that mass shootings have resumed and that racism and xenophobia permeate our headlines. We acknowledge our brokenness, our deep wounds, but we crave joy. Bonhoeffer tells us that God leads us through happiness and unhappiness, always and only toward God. I wanna share a poem of my own called Easter Worry, which is surprisingly like Jeremy's call to worship. Easter Worry. This morning, the churchyard is covered in a dusting of pollen as if a light snow fell during the night, changing everything it touched, and the world emerged thrumming and green. Who knows what part the wind played or where it comes from, how it swirls the bees into a lazy spin above the garden and lifts the sparrows to their nest on a window ledge beneath the eaves. The sky fills with winged creatures, magnolia blossoms, sweet notes of familiar hymns and all the unutterable prayers for the child that never foams, the neighbor with a spot on her lung, the father who cannot be pleased. Much is said about the meaning of the mystery. I think of it as something remembered then shared, like a small nest holding everything we love. It's no coincidence that Reverend Rutledge and I both describe birds, nests, and eggs as central images in our poems today. Is there any better metaphor for how we feel right now? Tiny yet unborn baby birds encased in delicate shells are protected and yet they are so vulnerable. 
Even the nests seem precariously high atop treetops in the wind. Many of us feel fragile in some way. Perhaps a bit of hopelessness still resides inside of us, and that's okay. We should find comfort in the Easter story as we gather as a community today. Let us remember that God is with us and will help guide us through this transformation to our new post-pandemic lives. We pray for the patience to listen and the wisdom to hold on to all that joy and pain that life has to offer. We understand that our future is not a world without problems, but today we feel God's joy within us and swirling around us. We pray that the mystery of the resurrection and the new life will shine through. Amen. Arnett Umstead, and I will be reading the scripture this morning, which is from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 from the Inclusive Bible. When the Sabbath was over, Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought perfumed oils so that they could anoint Jesus. Very early, just after sunrise on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked, they found that the huge stone had been rolled back. 
On entering the tomb, they saw a young person sitting at the right, dressed in a white robe. They were very frightened. But the youth reassured them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Now go and tell the disciples and Peter, Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. They made their way out and fled from the tomb, bewildered and trembling. But they said nothing to anyone because they were so afraid. May we hear the wisdom in these words. Thanks be to God. Good morning and happy Easter. If you're a kid and you're listening for the key word or idea this Easter morning, we are thinking together about new life. And as we think about that, you might look on the bookshelves behind me, and if you look carefully, you might be able to find a former egg. And it's in that spirit that I offer this teaching, which is entitled, The New Life Won't Be Like the Old. Sarah planted a garden on Ash Wednesday. She got the idea from Jennifer, who suggested that we all plant climate victory gardens. And from Kendra, who invited us to mark the season by doing something different every day. Sarah tended the garden every day. After six weeks, the garden had become a favorite place. Although we only had a small patch of sunlit soil, Sarah had worked with it to produce nearly a dozen varieties of edible plants, including tomatoes, peas, peppers, kale, and lettuce so prolific that we could pick it for salads one day and it seemed to be back the next. During Lent, we set chairs in the garden and had our lunches there. New life was literally growing all around us. It was helpful to see after the year we've had, after all, so much has been lost. I'm not going to go over the litany as we know it too well, though I will say that for as long as we live, we should remember the ones who have died of COVID, their names as Marjorie wrote, etched on the altars of our hearts and tumbling through the sky above us. We have lost so much that it is a kind of comfort to go to the garden and sit with the small things that grow, watch the green that has pushed through in the midst of it all. This is how Easter always begins with women like Sarah, Jennifer, and Kendra in the garden they invited us to cultivate. This is how Easter always begins with women like Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, in the graveyard where they had gone with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. This is how Easter always begins, after a time of great longing and loss, with people who gather to mark the moment and work out the path ahead, the path of life, leading them forward, one small step at a time. According to Mark's story of Easter, which is the oldest in the canonical Gospels in our Bibles, when the women went to the tomb, they did not find Jesus there, but rather a young man dressed in white. His clothing marked him as an angel or a heavenly emissary, and he told them not to be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, he continued, but he isn't here. Go tell the disciples that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. The women, we are told, go out, filled with terror and amazement. They will be the first bearers of the good news. In keeping with Mark's style, the story is short and it moves quickly, yet it also provides direction. Jesus is not in the tomb, but is to be found on the way. He has gone ahead of you. 
said the messenger. Some interpreters think a fragment of Mark's gospel was lost, and so this open ending wasn't really the original. Others think that Mark left things deliberately unresolved in order to let readers puzzle through. Yet most seem to agree that there was an emphasis on carrying the message forward. Biblical scholar Susan Watts Henderson says that Mark's commitment is to the good news of the coming kingdom or kingdom of God, which is markedly different than any conventional kingdom or empire. God's kingdom, Henderson writes, operates in restorative, vulnerable solidarity with the weak. This was a constant theme of Jesus' life and teachings, and Mark's story emphasizes the contours of the kingdom and the implicit choice we must each make about which way we are going to go. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome choose to go forward in the way of Jesus, telling the good news and convincing the men to join the gathering movement. Incidentally, these three women, according to Mark, were the ones who had stayed with Jesus until the end. This is how the Easter story always begins, with women like them, with women who go forward to plant, suggest, and invite, with women who are terrified, amazed, and committed to the ongoing story of life in the midst of it all. It's a good word for us on this particular Easter morning, because we now stand where Easter always begins with women looking into an uncertain future, but also with some good news to share about a different way. What strikes me most about the Easter story this year is that the new life simply won't be like the old. The messenger who meets the women doesn't say that Jesus has gone back. He says that Jesus has gone ahead. He doesn't say that everything will soon be the same. He gives them a new word to share. He doesn't offer them any real certainty. He only suggests that they follow the open road, and so they go. I don't know if this is simply a fragment, or if Mark intended to leave us such a powerfully open ending, yet I do know that the story in this form isn't really centered on Jesus. The Easter story, as Mark tells it, casts the women as the first preachers, tellers of good news, and it turns our gaze to the way ahead. In Mark's typical sto style, the story is on the move. It has places to go, and it is going someplace new. We too are going someplace new, if we do what the women did. Namely, go ahead, looking for the Christ we will find on the way. And you can hear the switch being made in the story, the mystical change from Jesus, the once historical person, to Christ, the divine that is hidden in every neighbor, stranger, enemy, and friend. Jesus, the historical person, hinted at it. But when did we feed you, clothe you, visit you, or care for you, they asked. Whenever you did it to the least of these, whenever you did it to anybody, you did it for me, he said. And as the early church began, that movement dedicated to carrying on Jesus' teachings and putting them into practice, his followers began to look for the Christ in everybody. And when they glimpsed it, it changed everything. For the new life wasn't like the old. There have been times in my own life when I would not have welcomed this word. I wouldn't have wanted a new life, preferring the old. I wasn't looking for change, didn't hope for something different, and certainly wouldn't want to be transformed. But this year, this year I long 
for a new life that is not like the old. Because in spite of this ongoing and painful pandemic, or maybe because of it, I have seen the old life in a different light. The old life was so individualistic. The old life was so comfortable. The old life was so concerned with personal preference, choice, and the attempt at control. The old life had not yet been shaken by the suffering of COVID, the length of our winter, the lists of names and anguished prayers. And the new life has begun to emerge out of all of these things, bringing with it the invitation to leave this graveyard and begin following the way of Jesus differently. In my almost 50 years of life in church, this almost never happens. We are being given the rare opportunity to follow the way of Jesus differently, not like we used to do it. Since last Easter, We've seen it. Many have joined our church remotely, friends from other states and around the country, friends who could not make it downtown for services on Sunday morning, friends who work, who are differently abled, who have health vulnerabilities, and who have been harmed by religion and simply wished to check out church in a safe way. Through the use of technology this year, we have expanded the circle of our welcome. New life has come, pushing through during the most trying times. And even as we long to be together again in person, and even as we plan for how to do that safely, the church that we are now, the church that we are becoming, is not like the old one. In the near future, we will be a live-streamed church. We'll be in-person and remote. We'll be old friends and new ones. We'll be continuing to widen the circle of our welcome, acceptance, and inclusion for all, which is wonderful, but it won't be easy. Because we are being asked to reimagine our lives, our faith, and our church. We are being asked to follow the way of Jesus and make the good news available to all, to see the Christ in every person and the earth, and to actually change ourselves, change our patterns and rhythms and practices and preferences to take on the contours of the kingdom. There will be no insiders and outsiders, no difference between who is in person and who is at home, who's been around a long time and who just got here, who is healthy and who is vulnerable, who has this preference and who has that one. There will only be one church, all of us together, on the way, changed by this new chance to see and be seen, hear and be heard, care and be cared for as we live out our faith differently. I'll be honest, I don't really know how we're going to do it. So much is uncertain. But if the women are any indication by which I mean Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, if the women are any indication, by which I mean Sarah, Jennifer, and Kendra, if the women are any, indi any indication, then I believe we're going to be just fine. More than fine. We'll flourish. It brings me back to the garden. At the end of Lent, or should I now say at the beginning of Easter, it has become a favorite place. I look at the green shoots pushing through the soil and hear their silent reminder. 
The new life won't be like the old, but it will grow all around us if we tend it. Amen. And now we're invited to contribute to the offering with the reminder that all the money we collect is used to support our church, which is a house of welcome for all people. And it's also used to support our work for justice and peace in the world outside our walls. I'd also like to remind you that we have a COVID-19 relief fund. And if you or someone you know in the circular community is suffering the economic effects of this pandemic. You can reach out to me or any staff member confidentially, and we have funds that may be able to help. It's in that spirit, and it's in gratitude for everyone's generosity that we pass the plate at this time.
invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. I also invite you to reach out and let us know how you're doing so that we can help each other through this time. I'd also like to mention that this uh, prayer was written kind of in the spirit of Gary Snyder's poem for the children. Uh, we don't use copyrighted poetic works or other works on YouTube out of respect for our poets and writers. Uh, but I'd encourage you to look up Gary Snyder's For the Children and read it yourself. He talks about going lightly into the future, and it's in that spirit that I wrote this prayer, and I invite you to join me. To the God of going light, we pray our thanks for the year as teacher. May we hold on to what matters most and let go of what doesn't. Help us as things begin to change, to resist any idea of normal and embrace something more liberating. Help us to notice again the children and the birds, our elders and our breath. Help us to speak again for what matters more than money to listen again for who matters more than the powerful, finding in the spirit of our faith that the beloved community has been born to us this year in Black Lives Matter marches, in justice ministry gatherings, in solidarity with Asian Americans, in resistance to LGBTQ plus bigotry in love with the earth and the beauty of our low country home. To the God of going light, we pray for help going light, holding on to, as the poet said, 
the vision of children and flowers and a future for all, every beautiful body welcomed and celebrated and the sharing of our resources freely done in love. And as we pray this, we hold for a breath all the joys and concerns of our lives. And we also name a prayer for all who are sick today, for all who are grieving, for all who struggle with addiction and the ones who are in recovery, for all who are lonely, for all the world's peacemakers, and for all who respond to the climate crisis and who seek a future for all life. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus who went lightly, loving God and neighbor, and leaving the rest. We remember his example as we pray together in his way.
turns as we go from here, let us go as the women did, with a little good news and with a new way of looking, going forward with the eyes to see the Christ in every person. If we do this, then the new life really won't be like the old. Amen.